I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Mary Anastasio Grady, the America's columnist for the Wall Street Journal, watching democracy in South America, democracy in the new world. Two different countries, two different directions right now. For the presidency in Peru, there is a very close contest underway. The voting is done, but they're, t- they're counting now, and the candidates are important. Because there are two different directions I learned from Mary. One candidate, Pedro Pablo Kuczynski. The other, Kaiko Fujimori. Mary, a very good evening to you. Thank you for this. I understand the count is underway. It's very close. So let's look at the choice between these two. Because if I understand, Peru's economy has blossomed since the exit of a man named Fujimori. Some uh, at the beginning of this uh, 21st century. And now I believe this is his daughter running for office. What is Fujimora, Kaiko, Ms. Fujimora, what does she offer for Peru's future? Good evening to you. Good evening, John. Keiko Fujimori is about 40 years old, I think, and um, she is uh, has been a congresswoman in the Peruvian Congress, and she has a party that's called the Par- Popular Force Party. Um, she's worked very hard at building that party from the grassroots up, um, but she tends to be I would put her right of center um, in terms of economics. She's uh, she both she and um, Pedro Pablo Kaczynski, who won the first round balloting in April. So they, they but neither one of them got above fifty percent. So they had to have this runoff, and. Um, she offers so they they both are sort of in favor of the model that's been moving Peru out of poverty they've been growing faster and and developing really sort of in the chile line not probably not as successfully as chile yet but sort of in that direction and um but she is i would say sort of more of an economic nationalist and a populist than her her rival in this runoff election um you know she talked about uh um, expanding the role of the government uh, state-owned oil company. Uh, she criticized her rival because he wants to uh, export the natural gas. Peru has very abundant uh, re- um, reserves of natural gas, and the best way to uh, create wealth in the country is to put in the pipelines and liquefy it and put it on ships and ship it out of the country. And um, that's a big money-making thing for Peruvian development, and she says that that's giving the gas away to foreigners and it should be used by Peruvians, which, of course, is a very backward way of thinking about natural resources. Um, But on the other hand, you know, she's in in favor of the markets, the open markets that her father uh, from 1990 to 2000 uh, basically brought about in Peru. He ended the long reign of protectionism that made the country so poor. Um, and she's basically in favor of contracts and mining, which is very important to the country as well. So that's pretty much her, her style. She has control of, she will have control of the Congress. Her party did very well in the congressional elections, so they will have most of the seats. And if she becomes president, the Congress will probably pretty much rubber stamp everything she does. You call her an economic nationalist. Does she boast about that? And and because she's an economic nationalist, does that make her a populist? I can't tell, Mary. She seems to, to be attacking her rivals as rich. Yeah, and, you know, I, I kind of uh, chided her for that in my column because this is the daughter of the former president. Um, so she didn't exactly come from the barrio, as I said in my column. And, you know, she went to Columbia University. She has an MBA. Um, but I think that, you know, there's always this tendency for politicians to kind of, um, you know, touch the nerve of people who – it touched the nerve of envy, and I, that happens more in Latin America than it does in the U.S. Um, and uh, although there's some of that going on, I think in this election in this country, but um, she is she she wants to sort of create an image of her as being one of the people, you know, so she goes out, she does a lot of grassroots politicking, a lot of pressing the flesh, you know, and um, the nationalism, I would say, is just sort of, like I said, with resources, wanting to expand the role of the oil company, because it's the Peruvian oil company, and wanting to somehow create some sort of divisions about how the natural gas could be used. That was a very effective strategy for Evo Morales in Bolivia. 
um, because otherwise she didn't have a lot of ways to distinguish herself from her rival. As I said, she was right of center. She believed in private property and contracts. And, you know, she doesn't, um, she's not uh, saying that the government should confiscate property. And, you know, so she had to distinguish herself from PPK. And I think that she tried to frame him of, as this big white guy in a country that has a real racial mix. Um, many people uh, of indigenous background and focus on the fact that he is super successful. So he has a lot of money. Well, and well let's meet. Let's meet divisions in that. Let's meet PPK. Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, a former investment banker. How how is his vision of Peru? What does it include? The mining? Yes. But what about investment? Well, you know, he he came to see me in April here because he he took a trip to New York after the first round, and and uh, one of the big things that he spent a lot of time talking about is the large informal economy in Peru, and he argues that the the um, the tax and regulatory environment is so oppressive that people do not want to be in the formal economy because once you get in the formal economy, you have high taxes and lots of regulation. But the problem is if you stay in the informal economy. You don't have access to credit because, you you know, you don't have contracts, you don't have assets that are on the books and so forth. So he says, look, if we cut taxes and cut the regulation and simplify what it takes to be a form in the formal economy, people will want to come into the formal economy because the incentive is that they could then have access to credit and they can grow their companies. So he's saying that a lot of the economy is being left behind because it's not formal. That's one of his big issues. And the second one, which is major, um, he calls it the centerpiece of his campaign, is that he feels strongly that Peru, if they want, if it wants to, can get uh, running water into every home in Peru. Now, that's a big project, but what's interesting for me is that he rejects the World Bank and the IDB's method of doing this, which is to fire all the private water companies and bring in some single project and single supplier. And he says, you know, you have 54 regional water companies. You You know, give them the incentive to start building the water. Yes, the government has to subsidize it, but then people also have to pay water bills. And in return for paying water bills, you give them shares in the company. So you make them very much stakeholders in the supply of the water, not just as consumers, but as owners of the company. So I find him very creative in the different ways that he wants to change some fundamental problems that are holding Peru back from becoming a developed country. Fujimora, her father was associated with abuse of the Constitution with what looked to be a rolling coup, and he had players around him who were shady. Is she, is she suffering for any of that? Is that held against her? Oh, I think so. I mean, um, on the one hand, a lot of people liked Fujimori because The Shining Path was slaughtering uh, people, especially the peasants. I mean, if you lived in the big city, it wasn't so bad, but they would go into towns and people would wake up in the morning and there would be dogs hanging from lampposts. And that was how The Shining Path let people know that they had arrived in town. It was a terrifying time, and it was also a time of a terrible hyperinflation. So it was very rough on the poor. And he turned both of those situations around. So a lot of people are very uh, loyal to Fujimori. But a huge part of the country resented the fact that he stayed in power for 10 years. He fired the Congress in 1992 and did what they called a self-coup. Then he, he rewrote, he got a constituent assembly to rewrite the Constitution. And then he said, well, my first term doesn't count, so uh, I'm going to run again, and it's going to be my first term. So he ended up staying for 10 years. And a lot of the same people that were around him are around her. So a lot of people don't trust uh, her respect for institutions, if I can put it that way. Um, She's tried to distance herself from that behavior of her father. Um, But I don't think that she's been effective, and part of that is because she still has a lot of the same people around her. The Shining Path, that was a guerrilla terrorist organization. They were gangsters, mm-hmm. and they brutalized yep. the countryside. Is she given credit for that today, or is that is that no longer an issue? Is that in the past? There's no Shining Path to threaten the people. Well, I would say that that is in the past, but, you know, Peru still has a, a crime problem, 
And um, and again, this is a distinction between her and, and PPK because she's very much of sort of like uh, iron fist uh, mm-hmm. response to this. And she will put tanks in the street or do whatever she has to do to restore law and order. And he says, look, we need better judges. We have to upgrade the quality of our judges. We need more police. Um, and he focuses a lot on intelligence. He says that we need intelligence. Um, a, a strong intelligence network rather than trying to just fight them, you know, mano a mano. I'm speaking with Mary Anastasio Grady. We're talking about democracy in action, and we're looking at the election in Peru. The results are not final yet. It's very close between a candidate who is a former investment banker and a candidate who is the daughter of a former strongman, Caudillo. We move now to Colombia when we come back because democracy is threatened there as well. Its president is in trouble, very disapproved. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Mary Anastasia O'Grady, a democracy, we're touring it in South America. These are countries that have struggled with statism, with caudillos, with violence, with terror. No more so than Colombia because of the threat of FARC. We were speaking of the Shining Path. The FARC is an ongoing Shining Path, although many of its leaders have refuge in Cuba, where they are sometimes entertained by the Secretary of State of the United States of America. But in any event, (laughs) the president of the country is seeking, unpopularly, to forgive and forget, reconciliation without anybody punishing. His name is Juan Manuel Santos. What is he proposing, Mary, and why is he so unpopular? Well, Santos has been negotiating with the FARC in Havana since 2011, Um, And when I interviewed him about that in August of 2012, he said, well, don't worry. I told the FARC, this is going to be a matter of months, not years. (laughs) So now we're five years into this, and uh, they have not granted one concession um, to the government. They say that they have no money, and it's quite well known that they have billions of dollars uh, from their They're drug drug smugglers. They're drug smugglers. (laughs) They have Um, no money? You You mean no ready cash in Havana? Is that what they're talking about? Presumably, in the beginning of the negotiations, they were going to have to make reparations to the victims because they have killed a lot of people in Colombia. They're very hated. And, um, uh, and th- but they also say they will not spend even one day in jail. And President Santos has agreed to that. He says, OK, well, you can go out and be in some sort of area on a farm or something and your movements will be limited, but by miles, not by you know feet as you would in a jail cell. Um, so he hasn't gotten anything from them. And basically, they want to basically be forgiven for everything they've done and go into politics. And my argument is they're going to have money and they're going to have their weapons because they say they're not going to hand in their weapons. They refuse to do that also. Um, and, you know, you have money, you have weapons and you have a drug trafficking business and you're going into into politics. I mean, I don't think we have to think too hard about what kind of an outcome we're going to have there. You have the cocoa growers running Bolivia now, and they won't leave. And and that's, I think, I'm afraid, where Colombia is headed if they sign this agreement. When Juan Manuel was elected, he did he promise to make peace at any cost as as a contrast for his predecessor Uribe? Is that what he's doing, following some some once upon a time promise that everybody else has forgotten? Because you report his approval rating is twenty one percent. There's nobody demanding that he give the FARC a free pass. Well, when he was first elected, he was elected because he had been. Um, Alvaro Uribe, President Uribe's defense minister, and he was considered a real hawk against the, the FARC. So th- the the election, his first election was considered a continuation of the Uribe policy of democratic security in the country. His second election, um, where he won very narrowly, um, was on a promise that he would get this peace agreement done. And, you know, Colombians are desperate. So if you ask them, do you want peace? They're going to say yes, of course. 
But then if you start to ask them, you know, under what conditions, um, very few of them agree with, you know, the kinds of concessions that he's making to these guys who are living, as you mentioned, the high life in Havana. I mean, there was one photo that was going around the, the, the internet of them on a catamaran for the afternoon. I mean, these are, peop- these are war criminals who have committed amazing atrocities, have not been asked to give up one single thing for, you know, to pay for their crimes. And, you know, they're living this highlight. And by the way, we don't know who's paying for all those mojitos that they're drinking in Havana for the last five years. But um, I have a feeling it's the Colombian government. The president, has he misled the people? Is, is that the charge against him? Is that why his approval rating is so low? I can't tell. I mean, a president doesn't seem very effective with a Gallup poll of 21 percent approval rating. Well, there's a number of things going on there. Some people feel that he's misled them. Um, some people feel that he just hasn't sealed the deal. So, um, you know, crime is going up and they feel like, you know, he hasn't delivered on his promises. Um, But there's other problems, too. There are economic problems and um, things have not gotten done in Colombia because he's been super obsessed with this one thing. Um, So uh, all the other things that you would expect a a government to do during, you know, eight years have just been pushed to the wayside, and I think that there's a, some level of dissatisfaction with that, too. Final detail about the president. He seems to have relatives involved in this negotiation. It's all very shadowy. Who is Enrico Santos? Enrique Santos is his older brother, who um, is well known as a, uh, many friends in the FARC, um, wrote in a book uh, that came out in 2014 that he had actually even sympathized with the armed conflict, in other words, the FARC's methods of killing civilians. Um, and it, what he wrote about in this book was he said that his brother um, enlisted him in the early stages to approach the FARC and to set up the deal of, you know, the FARC members going to Havana um, to help in transporting them secretly and to do all of this while every third day, and this is what he wrote in his book, every third day the president was out saying that he would never negotiate with the FARC until they laid down their arms. And then he goes on to explain how they were building this whole idea and putting all the pieces in place to have the negotiations while the president was saying that to the people of Colombia. Um, so it's a, not really much of a confidence builder, in my opinion, for citizens who find out that their president has been lying to them effectively since day one. Mary Anastasio Grady, Democracy in uh, the New World. In Peru, we're waiting for the results. And in Colombia, disappointment because the results point to an accommodation with gangsters. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show.